sugar is making you age terribly. If there's one molecule we should have less of in our diets, if you want to live a healthier, happier life, it would be sugar. And I know it tastes nice, but we also need to figure out how to get the proportions in such a way as it doesn't shorten your lifespan. So let's talk about why sugar is aging you and what we need to do to reduce that effect. My mission is to help clinicians around the world integrate longevity into their aesthetic practices. The trend is absolutely towards wellness. The whole world is becoming more and more interested about how to live healthier lives and that starts with your skin and how you feel. Many aesthetic practitioners are already doing this and I'm gonna help you do it faster with a more solid grounding in the science. I'm gonna be building a world-class longevity clinic in this building. We're gonna do everything you already know me for, plus a whole lot more. I'm building a team of clinicians and PhD researchers who are gonna do this work for you, pass it on so that you know exactly how to structure your business so that you can be part of the longevity revolution. So how does sugar actually age us? Well, the interesting thing about sugar is it is a reactive molecule. That's why our bodies want it. The problem is it doesn't always react in the places where we want it to. It can react against the inside of your blood vessel walls. It can react against cells. This is essentially a burning like process. So it literally causes an oxidation when it comes into contact with certain tissues. And this is damaging. This causes our cells to become inflamed and this triggers an inflammation cascade that damages other cells. The more sugar that you eat, the higher your blood sugars get, the more likely you'll have inflammation alongside these important surfaces inside your body that cause end organ damage. If you become diabetic, essentially it's the process of sugar destroying the inside of your blood vessels and then destroying the organs that need those blood vessels. Brain, kidney, gut, eyes all of them suffer terribly with high blood sugars and it's a very easy thing to control when you learn how to do it so is continuously high blood sugar the cause of diabetes that is almost the definition of diabetes which is high blood sugar high blood sugar then causes the disease that you actually see the level of concentration of sugar in your blood is not actually the disease it's the marker for something that will go on to cause the disease that kills us. So we're always trying to reduce the cause of inflammation and sugar is a very strong cause of inflammation in most people's bodies. So I actually work hard to cut sugar out of my diet. I'm not obsessive about it, but it does help to decrease my sugar load. But why did I start doing that? For me, it actually started in 2015. I noticed I'd started to put on a little bit of weight, but I also noticed as I started creating content for this channel and others that I was less good at doing so after lunch. I noticed that the more sugar or carbohydrate that I consumed, the less good I was at actually thinking. So this is essentially something is going on that's affecting my brain. There's either a degree of inflammation or blood sugar itself that stops our neurons working as well in certain situations. Interestingly, I also had another change which I noticed, which is a decrease in lower back pain. I used to get chronic lower back pain. I remember being on ward rounds as a junior doctor always seeming to have this lower back pain that I'd be flexing, trying to find a comfortable position. And it would follow me around for years until I dramatically reduced sugar. And I think there's something around the inflammation caused by sugar intake that may have been associated with inflammation in my lower back. Many people will notice this with certain foods. You get aches and pains if you trigger something if you consume something that triggers inflammation. And this is, for me, seems to be associated with sugar. So the association of high carbohydrate intake and tiredness, lethargy, brain fog, the inability to think and articulate myself clearly, aches and pains, and then often poor sleep, particularly if I had sugar close to bed, all seem to be related to an underlying lack of ability to process sugar efficiently. When I had a genetic Ow. test, I discovered that my genes were not set up to process sugar efficiently. So I am at a higher risk of type two diabetes. Then I started wearing a glucose monitor and discovered to my dismay how poor I really was. So even a few crisps or a piece of a sandwich that's got simple carbs in it, like white bread, and I would get a huge glucose spike, often up to 11 or 12, which is not good. And this all inspired me to dramatically reduce my sugar consumption, and if I do eat sugar, to always do it in the right sequence after eating protein and carbohydrate to decrease that glucose load, the spike in blood sugars, triggered by normal food. It may be interesting for you to understand how little sugar it actually takes to change your blood sugar. We, in our bloodstream in total, only have about one teaspoon of sugar. So you can imagine when you eat a meal, how hard your body's working to keep your blood sugars in a normal range. It's a very hard thing to do, and we are well designed to do it, 
But unfortunately, we cannot do it on a chronic basis in the way that Western society demands that we do. And this is what triggers so much of the inflammation and accelerated aging that we're trying to avoid. So how do we change our habits and behaviors around sugar? One of the biggest problems we face in Western civilization is a calorie surplus. We are so good at growing food, particularly sugary food, that there is a surplus of it and is often sold for much less than the more rich and calorie dense food that take longer to digest but also longer to grow for example protein so much of our food pyramid is essentially around getting access to carbohydrate and this is an efficient way to feed a population but unfortunately we don't stop eating when we've had enough and we keep consuming the cheapest food which is also the most rewarding because in the days where we first evolved this was actually quite a rare event to find sweet foods. We would get it basically at the end of summer. You have your harvest season, you eat your fruits, you get a bit fat for the winter, and then you go back to a much healthier diet while you burn through that fat until spring. Unfortunately, now it is basically harvest season 24-7, 365, and we are surrounded by foods that we would never normally come into contact with. Foods that our brains tell us are very important to eat, very delicious, very rewarding, but unfortunately will make us sick because we're just not honed to eat it all year round. So what should you try and switch your diet towards? There are certain populations around the world that seem to live longer than others, and the Mediterranean is associated with a longer period of life and a healthy period of life more interestingly when i've been to the mediterranean i've noticed some really important differences with how they eat food the first is often the order in which they eat food a starter is often a greek salad for example which is high in fiber protein and fat and very little if any carbohydrate this is then followed by a meal that is often high in protein so fish for example a few vegetables as well and then maybe you would have a little bit of carbohydrate on the side but the ratios are very different to how we might see a western diet where we may start with something sweet and high in carbs followed by even more carbohydrate this seems to be one of the associations with living longer and it simply is harder to eat more calories when you eat in that order but the calories that you do eat even the sugar or the carbohydrate takes much longer to penetrate into your bloodstream which means it's easier for your pancreas to remove that sugar and make sure that your cells do not get a dramatic spike in blood sugars but also means you're less likely to eat as much so the mediterranean diet is one of the most data supported diets in terms of longevity and there are many other interesting diets that we'll talk about in future episodes but if you want to follow the most scientifically backed diet it is a low carbohydrate mediterranean diet plenty of fish plenty of vegetables and leafy greens and low volumes of simple carbohydrates but interestingly higher concentrations of certain good fats such as olive oil and many of the cheeses associated with that region interestingly there may also be some benefit to the cheese and the way that it affects your gut bacteria which is also associated with longevity so what advice would you give to your patients or even advice you might take for yourself to reduce reduce sugar intake. There's something that I've battled with a lot and I think it helps a lot to think about what makes you more likely to consume sugar. I noticed certain pathological thought patterns that I'd picked up that made it more likely I would consume more sugar. One, for example, was that I would go shopping when I was very hungry for lunch and then I would tell myself that my treat was only a one-off until I noticed on one of my till receipts that I'd done it three times in a week which basically doesn't make it a treat, it makes it a normal way of living. So I had to realize that my normal day-to-day -day choice had to be healthy or it would be by default basically sugar because that's the most rewarding thing. So this involves a shift in identity and many health behaviors are actually directly correlated with what you believe to be true about yourself. And if I believe it's true of myself that I only have a treat occasionally, but that's three times a week, and then I spot that, that's gonna be easier to then reject that because I don't want I don't identify as someone who treats myself every single time I go out and this became a jarring fact that I had to change my perception change my habits around in order to make better choices this takes time and don't expect it to happen immediately but start to think about what other identities you could use or in your patients that they could use to empower them to be consistent. So for example, some people may have an identity of being very organized. And if they say something, that's what they do. You can actually use that identity to make you make better choices with your food once you link food choices with a more empowering identity. Now, many people are stuck with identities such as, in fact, I've met people who identify as overweight. They will say, I remember one of my colleagues literally saying many times, I'm fat, that's why I'm gonna say yes to that snack. And it really intrigued me because he had identified with the state that he was and was making choices to be in alignment with his identity, which I know to be a psychological truth. People make choices to confirm their identity. But he also had many other empowering aspects of identity, which he could have chosen 
as a different way to make decisions. So think about what you're proud of about your identity and use that to correlate with your food choices and you will often come up with better patterns of behaving. Other things I find really helpful is to create an environment that doesn't tempt you. So if you create a story that there's a bag of crisps in your house that you'll only have on occasion, I know for me, that occasion seems to be every night around 10 o'clock if I'm not careful. So the only way I can defend myself against that weakness is just to never buy crisps. And I'm afraid it is a hard and fast rule. If you have a rule of, I'll have some sometimes for a treat, unfortunately, you will never change that system. It'll always control you. Our brains are too weak to look at a bag of crisps, most of us anyway, and not eat it at some point when you actually don't really want to eat it from the bigger picture perspective. So I'd highly encourage everyone to make choices that are fairly basically inflexible and firm about what you bring into your immediate environment. The truth is, once you leave your house, there are many things that will distract you and you'll still be weaker in those situations. And it's important just to try and create one closed space where you know that you are not going to be constantly tempted to do things that you don't actually want to do. And that's the underlying message here is we're actually helping individuals to do what they actually want to do. And you're not depriving yourself. You're creating an environment that makes you feel empowered to live the life that you want to live. And that means when you go out and you do have a bag of crisps occasionally, you don't have to feel as bad about it because you know they never enter your house. So what's the big takeaway from this episode? I'm a huge believer that given the right information, more people will make a better choice more of the time. And in fact, a huge part of the project which we're now embarking is to provide that good information. Because as a longevity practitioner or an aesthetic practitioner helping patients in this domain, you're gonna to need to provide them with the reasons to change behavior long before they're actually likely to change. So I found using a CGM really a game-changing moment for me because I could suddenly see the information associated with how I was feeling and what I was putting into my mouth. And this, without much effort, started to change the behavior that I was exhibiting. Even though I knew already that certain snacks were not good, I'd still do it because I wouldn't see the result. Maybe a few hours later, I'd feel a bit tired, but when I looked at the CGM and I could correlate those behaviors with the glucose spike with the feeling, suddenly I didn't want to do the same things anymore. And this is one of the things I think we need to set up for our patients is the feedback mechanisms that allow them to make better decisions naturally. It doesn't take as much willpower when you can see the change that you don't want when you make a bad choice and the change that you do want when you make a good choice, it becomes a much more natural way to be. So let's do that together. If you wanna learn more about this topic, make sure you follow. We're going on a big, exciting, adventure to learn everything we can about longevity and help you apply it in your clinics and if you're a patient then of course you can learn with us